is, it is really a great pleasure to introduce uh, your, our next speaker. You are in for such a treat. Um, she's our golden girl, I think it's fair to say, Dame Kelly Holmes. Um, you might remember 2003, Kelly had sort of quite a bad time with injury. And there's the 2004 Athens Olympics just looming over her head. It was a huge challenge. Um, and yet it was a challenge that she not just met, but she smashed, getting two gold medals at that Olympic Games, one for the 800 metres and one for the 1500 metres. So this is somebody who knows, we've been talking about challenges and rising up to meet them all throughout this conference and especially now, this is somebody who knows about adversity and meeting it head on. Uh, what you might not know about Kelly and what she may not tell you is that she had a little childhood ambition. I love this story, so I'm going to share it. Um, it was a sweet shop in her local area that she really adored. And she said to herself, like we all do as children, one day I'm going to own that sweet shop. She bought it. She knocked it through. She now owns a cafe on top of everything else. And uh, it's stock full of very nice uh, treats indeed. The dreams become real. Please put your hands together and welcome Dame Kelly Holmes. <laughs> Hello everyone. Good conference so far? Good. <laughs> um, sorry, age. It's an age thing. Uh, so my biggest challenges of the day were walking up in these high hills. I haven't put them on for a while. And the fact that I've been told I've got 20 minutes. Um, I normally waffle on for 45, so bear with me and uh, let's see how we get on. But anyway, um, thank you very much. It's an honour to be here, to be honest with you. Um, the NHS has been very close to my heart as well, as I will tell you through my little presentation uh, today. And I want to just go through a little bit of my journey, um, some impacts uh, that things have happened to me and also people close to me, and actually to celebrate uh, the great work that um, is done by the NHS and you in particular. Um, so Athens, of course, was my defining moment, 2004. I won two Olympic gold medals. Uh, but it was an end of a long journey, as we all know, and uh, like most things are. Um, it's funny how it has to take a sort of a massive uh, achievement in the public eye to actually get any form of kind of recognition, even if you've been battling away for years and years and years um, and doing great anyway, but it has to take this one big mountain to move and then people start to, to look at what you do. Um, you know, in sport and in most things in life, uh, I had years of pressure and um, uh, lots of failures in my mind. Um, negative publicity, uh, the special moments that had come, constantly monitoring everything that I was doing, changing of my focus occasionally throughout the years, um, re-evaluating my targets. But to be honest with you, the main thing that remained was my ultimate goal, to become Olympic champion. Uh, since, the, since 1984, when I was 14 years old, I was blown away by what is the most iconic sporting event in the world, the Olympic Games. As a 14-year-old, you can be, have uh, lots of impressions, good or bad, but for me, that's one thing that made me feel who I was, maybe come alive. I was the person that sat outside the classroom most of the time at school. Uh, I can't say I'm proud of it, but it happened. Um, <laughs> and it was only when uh, running was introduced to me by my PE teacher that absolutely told me I was going to be a runner. There was no compromise. Um, I was going to run this cross-country race, which I absolutely hated. Uh, the thought of wet, wind, cold, mud, especially when you've got a big afro hair and you're wearing the old um, apple catch and knickers that most of the women in here will probably know, the skirts, uh, the air techs, white shirts, the white plimp soles and the high knee white socks isn't conducive to cross-country. Um, but <laughs> uh, I came second in that race and it was the one thing that made me feel really good about myself. And that was a journey that I wanted. It was only later, actually, after when I was a senior athlete, um, after joining the army, which was another one of my ambitions, I was in there for 10 years, it was only as a senior that I really realised the impact of the Olympic values, determination, inspiration, courage, equality, friendship and respect. Uh, those are words that I hope that people sitting here will actually look at and think, hold on a minute, uh, that's pretty close to us. Um, Throughout my career, 
I won tw 12 medals. And as I say, it was only when I won the two gold medals did actually people kind of see a big achievement and celebrate that because it was a national uh, event. We like to cheer our heroes. Um, you know, we're all proud of where we're from, hopefully. And we look at something like that and you get excited and lots of people come up to me and remember the moments, you know, where they were in the pub, throwing their children up in the air, whatever it was. Uh, dogs barking, dogs, all, all the things I've heard, which have been amazing. But it was that. And, um, you know, I had uh, seven years of injury problems. I was probably one of those burdens on the NHS, I'm afraid. Um, uh, seven years of injuries, which actually shaped almost who I was, because I think in whatever we do in life, it's very easy to look at the negatives. It's really easy to go through all the failures and to bring those da down and to always, uh, you know, put those at the forefront of the mind. And we forget to celebrate the small successes, the successes that we actually have. We don't shout about those enough, you know, because we dwell, like everybody else, on the failures. And then that's the thing that becomes the, the public vision and um, whatever, we do, whatever we do. And when I was an athlete... It got to the point that literally the press were just, they knew I would probably get a medal, uh, but you know, you're written off almost. You're getting older, um, yeah, you can get there, but yeah, maybe you won't, maybe you won't. You know, you know, it's all these things that kind of get hammered into you. And um, when I was at my worst time uh, in my athletics career, you know, I ruptured my calf, tore my Achilles, I glandular fever, stuff, scratches. Um, uh, what else? I have tonsillitis. Uh, you name it, I probably had it in my seven-year career. And there's moments where, of course, I could have given up. Um, the easiest thing is to give up. And most athletes, actually, that have been established over the, the years, who we've seen years and years ago that you might have he heard of that didn't actually come to fruition, is because they gave up so easy. Because when the pressure's on, it's easy to run. But actually, for me... And in most athletes' minds, failure, loss is learning. You learn by mis that your mistakes. You look at other people doing things well who are shouting about it. What are they doing better than you? And actually, my hope in life was that I could be an Olympic champion. It was my dream. It was my vision. It always remained, no matter what changes were made, what direction I had to go in, it always remained the dream. Now, I'm very, very aware that um, to be the best, you've got to have a good team of people. I didn't want to just be the best, though. I wanted to be, I wanted to be great. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to just be good. I wanted to be great. And I think sometimes that's the thing. you kind of got to put into your minds, where do we want to go and how are we going to get there? To be great is to actually shout about it. And inside, I did. Well, I had to get a brilliant team behind me, a brilliant team of people who actually uh, were working all over the country, so were nationally uh, situated, but locally were doing some fantastic work in their own roles. The coach, the physio, the nutritionist, the doctor. They weren't world class, as in overseas, international, but they were world-class in their own ability to give the best, best, best treatment and care to the people that needed it on the ground. And I actually was an athlete on the ground at the end of the day. If I got ill, I went to my local GP. I didn't go to some world-class doctor all the time because actually it was the people that needed me, or I needed them, but they needed me to go to them because my doctor, I have to say, um, Paul Guzzi, <laughs> he's uh, still my doctor to this day. And uh, he knows everything about me. <laughs> he knows everything about me and he knows what's needed. So actually, sometimes local is best. But I had to influence those people to realise that together, they also could be great. So all of the people that were working with me, my team, had to actually come together for us to realise our full potential. I had a physio. Her name was Alison Rose. Without her, I wouldn't be standing here to this day saying a double Olympic champion. Without my PE teacher telling me I could actually be good, looking me in the eye 
and telling me pretty much to get a grip. <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here to this day. And sometimes it only takes one person to make a huge change for someone's life. And sometimes it makes a collective people to get right to the top of the journey. As I see it, my journey was to try and reach the pinnacle of my career. It was a personal journey. It was fraught for injury, fraught for hard times, bad times, emotional moments, lots of tears. Uh, but I got there in the end. I'm going to show you, before I go through a little bit about what happened to me, um, a montage of Athens, uh, for those that have no clue who I am. Um, <laughs> Athens, 2004, a long time ago. It was the end of a long journey, as I said. A long journey that we only actually reflect on after the big things happen. And if I look back, you know, uh, did I celebrate some successes? Absolutely. You know, when you uh, are hoping to be an Olympic champion and you race at a, a big Olympic Games, it's your first one, and you get a stress fracture um, when you're flying over to your holding camp and you're told to go home because actually there's no way you're going to be running. Or if you do decide to run, you're on your own, but if you fall over, you know, God knows what's going to happen. You have to make big decisions in life. As an athlete, I made them. I ran at those Olympic Games. I ran with a stress fracture. I ended up coming fourth on the line, picked by the smallest things, pipped by the thickness of this dress. I was down. But actually, I thought to myself, wow, if I come fourth at an Olympic Games after three races with the best of the world and I've, run a stress, I've got a stress fracture, maybe I'm good enough. You go into the next year, you reevaluate some of the things that might not have gone so well, but then you're still holding on to the vision. I came into 1997 hoping, hoping that that year would be my year. In some degrees, it was. I became number one in the world, five seconds faster than any other British athlete in the 1,500 metres. Wrote the British record that stood for 12 years by Zola Budd. Do you remember Zola Budd, the barefooted young runner, fantastic runner? I thought I was going to be world champion that year. How could I not be world champion? I got a niggle in my Achilles tendon, went to the hospitals, went to the doctors, had a bit of treatment flew over to Athens, ironically. First race of the first day in those championships, ruptured calf, complete ruptured calf, tore Achilles. It was over. Down I was, looking at failure in a sob, but then thinking, hold on a minute, celebrating what actually had happened. I'd become number one in the world, I was good enough. And I kept the hope. And it was almost the, the story of my career. 2004, as you say, was a pinnacle. There's lots of things that happened in between, and we haven't got enough time, unfortunately, to give you a little bit more insight. But I'm going to show you this to remind yourself that actually, when we stick at what we believe in, things can happen and come true. We celebrate success and not keep dwelling on the failures. You know, we're always looking and measuring failure instead of shouting about success because only when you shout about success do you move on because, you, you know, you're proud. You, you've got more vision. If you stick back there, you don't make it. 2004, let's play this. Jordan is just in time for the women's 800 metres final. Kelly Holmes is bidding for a medal, but which one will it be? A real chance in this Olympic final for Kelly Holmes. I think she's strong enough to double up. She's a strong athlete, and there's no reason why she can't get a medal in two events. These last few moments really are nerve-wracking, but she's been in this position so many times now. You have all those dreams, and then something goes wrong, and I just thought everything's going too good, and it's going to go away from me again. Kelly Holmes attacking on the outside. What has Matola got less? Has Anviana got anything? What about Miles Clark? Kelly Holmes fighting for the gold medal with her training partner, Maria Matola. Kelly Holmes bringing it home for Britain. Can she get there? Come on, Kelly! One more, Gerd. Come on, Kelly Holmes! It's gold! Kelly's won the gold for Great Britain. What a performance!
You won it, Kelly. You've won it. Yes, you've won. Olympic champion, you've been waiting a lot of years for this. You've finally done it, girl. The final evening of athletics here in the Let's Olympic just Stadium. You that we're getting ever closer to the moment of truth for Kelly, Kelly Holmes. Has the chance to make history by achieving the middle distance double. It would be arguably the greatest ever achievement by a British. There's athlete. a new level of confidence with Kelly. She she oozes it. She we're not going to hang the gold medal round Kelly's neck just yet because she's got a tough race, some difficult. I'm miles. sure she can do it. I don't put too much pressure on her. I just told her the whole of Britain what you're watching, so don't worry about it. So can Kelly Holmes do it again? Pushing and shoving there, Thomas Shawmai didn't seem to have much, but she's going to go with Kelly. Kelly coming on the outside, looks so easy. Has she got enough in the home straight? Hayeska tries to move out, but Kelly looking round to see where the danger is. There doesn't appear to be too much. Now she's got to push on. Now she's got to kick for home. Kelly Holmes going for two gold medals. It's going to be Hannah Storick's second goal. performance that is the greatest performance in the history of british distance running kelly holmes has done now at the age of 34 what she's been threatening to do for the last 10 or 12 years she is the double olympic champion <laughs> thank you for the past tw nearly 12 years I keep meaning to delete that age bit. It's getting worse and worse and worse. I'm going to have to do it. Um, <laughs> that was the end of a long career, uh, like I mentioned. And um, I wanted to share something with you because we're here today. Uh, for those that don't know much about my actual story, the year before that, I had the worst time of my life. I, I suffered from really bad depression to the point of self-harm to looking in the mirror and not wanting to be here. For somebody that had a 10-year military career, an international athlete, very successful, uh, people, you know, would come out and think, what, how? End of the day, I'm human, like everybody else. Everybody else that's looked after by the NHS, we're all human beings at the end of the day. We struggle in our different ways, and I definitely struggled then. And it was because of people who ultimately wanted to do the best job possible uh, in their own field to help me reach my dream to be able to stand on that rostrum 20 years after first dreaming of being an Olympic champion. That's why I was there. And keeping with the hope and not giving up when it was getting tough is also why I was there. You know, the Olympic Brand is an international brand. Actually, do you know what? So is the NHS, because nobody else has got it, and they all want it. It's an industry that absolutely cares about the people that it looks after. No matter what publicity might come, whether good or bad, you know, we always elaborate the bad, of course, but we don't shout about the good. It's definitely an, an, an industry that cares uh, it's an industry where people go the extra mile. Um, we just need to shout about it more. I, on Tuesday, I started a charity nine years ago called Dame Kelly Homes Trust. We work with uh, young people from areas of deprivation, uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. And I was actually heartbroken on Tuesday because I met a girl, a teenager that is suffering badly, badly with mental health issues. I felt powerless. <laughs> what can I do? I can talk from experience. I can try and help. And one of the things that I think personally, and it's just my personal opinion, because I'm here with you guys, is that you know, there's some things that you can try as a big organisation. In all the things you've heard over the last three days, there's some things you can actually make a long-term impact and a solution of change. Our children are our future. 
Our children are absolutely our future. And I get disheartened all the time with the issues that are happening. This is a national, national issue. But locally, they need to deal with it. To celebrate some things very quickly, I am a little bit of a Twitterholic. And last night, I, sorry about this, I know it's unconventional, but there we go. I thought, what I'll do is, oh, I'm coming tomorrow. I'll just put a little tweet out. Now, I always worry sometimes when you put a little tweet out <laughs> of the abuse you might get back from questions that you ask. But I actually asked about, um, were you grateful for our NHS or don't you support it? What do you think? I don't know, 50, 50, 60, 40, 70, 98% grateful. After that, and don't dwell on the 2%, because actually it was only two people. I don't know how they worked that out. <laughs> I have no idea how 2% becomes two people, and it's, I had 2,699 people um, <laughs> tweet. I have no clue, but there you go. I just wanted to really quickly do the last couple of things, because I'm you know, running with my time as quick as I can just to celebrate and not just from me to say thank you, and you'll hear a big one at the end of this, but um, some other people that absolutely do care. These are people, I think I've got about, I don't know, 114,000 people on my Twitter, and they come, some are talk about motorbikes, some talk about tattoos, some talk about being fit, overweight, whatever it is. Okay, and uh, there was a couple, and I did not know what was going to come back. NHS saved my partner's life. It is invaluable to me. I've had a few major operations over the years, and the care I've always received has been first class. We are all grateful for the NHS for different reasons. Their C25K app has made me fitter and happier than I've ever been. We're very, very, very grateful to have our NHS. Uh, we need more done. We need more funding for them. Everyone would worry about if we lose it. We can never let that happen. It goes on and on and on. Some of them, like, literally brought a tear to my eye last night. Really did. Because the amazing work, the impact that you're having is saving lives, changing lives, and making a difference. Yes. There are things we all worry about and things that go wrong, and that's part of life. But essentially, you're making a big difference. And I want to just show you this last thing to finish off. I have to apologise. Uh, the guys have worked wonders, but I have to apologise. Um, I took it on my phone last night. Um, they're trying to put it up on the screen for me, so it might be a bit grainy. <laughs> uh, listen intently, but this is a message from someone very, very close to my heart, and it's a big thank you from me and from them. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Pam. I'm Kelly's mum. Uh, last year I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma um, and I've had so many tests at my local hospital, um, it's radiology department especially, um, my consultant Dr White who couldn't do enough and was sorting out all tests possible and obviously all the medication that I was given which was quite a lot. Um, I have to thank King's because I had my stem cell transplant up there. They were marvellous. They, they couldn't do enough and they looked after so many people so well. Um, and I'd just like to say a really big thank you to the NHS because there's no way I could have afforded it if it was private treatment. I wouldn't be here today, I don't think, and I, luckily I am in remission. So a very big thank you to the NHS. <laughs> And my mum gets embarrassed <laughs> by things, so uh, she really wanted to do it. But um, I think we've got a few question and answers oh, to come. Yeah, absolutely. Is that right? So, look, you, you know, thank you. First of all, come, come and have... Why don't you come sit down and we'll take some questions. Um, national treasure doesn't even begin to cover what we feel about you. I don't know uh, if this is the same for all of you, but I completely remember that moment, uh, and, and you sort of brought it all back, when um, you look up... Did I win? Did I win? And we're all <laughs> shouting at the screen, you know, you have won. I'll it tell was, you a little story about that, actually. When I crossed the line, I had no clue, because I never thought I'd win the 800 metres. I always thought I could get a medal, because I'd won 10 before that, 
five in 800 and five in the 15. So I always believed I can get a medal because it was the first year in seven because of that team that I said I got uh, uh, behind me that I wasn't injury free, I was in the shape of my life. And when I crossed the line, this time winning by the thickness of that, which is all right when you win, <laughs> when you lose, it's a pain in the butt. Um, <laughs> and I've done that many times, but I won. And I crossed the line and I suddenly was thinking, oh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't have won it, you know, kind of reverse. And you've got this big screen at the end of a, a stadium and it goes in slow play, you know, and you're just like, uh, and there's a photographer on the inside of me. He was jumping up and down with these uh, cameras going mental. And he went, Kelly, you've won, you know. Ah. <laughs> anyway, I met him three months later. He said, Kelly, the best night of my career ever. It was also the worst, because I didn't get one bloody photo of <laughs> <laughs> And that became photo of the year by another British photographer, oh, so he lucked out there. <laughs> um, if, you, if you've got a question or, or just anything you want to say, or just show some love to this amazing woman, just put <laughs> yeah, your hand on the air it's and, and uh, we'll get a, a Batman or Batwoman to you. Let's um, go to number six, first of all, yes. Hi, I'm Tori Otley Groom from Richmond CCG. If there were three things you could say to each member of our teams and staff that are working so hard, what would you say to encourage them and to keep meeting this great challenge together? Ooh, wow. Well, um, I would say sharing best practice, I think, is something critical. Um, I think sometimes things happen in silos. You think you're on your own, and, you know, and then you're burdened with that whole issues that might come with that. But actually, so many other people are doing it, uh, but you're not kind of sharing it, talking enough, communicating. I think that's, for me, one of the key things I, I would say. Um, uh, I would say that, you know, it the grind, like I say, you know, some things just take a long time. They take a long time to come through to fruition, but we lose hope, then what do we do? What, what, it's no point in losing hope. You know, it's that whole live with regrets type thing. If only I'd carried on, if only we'd plugged away to this, you know, we could have done even better. Like I say, it's all right to be good, but be best, be the best. And we are the best, you know. HS is the best, no one else in the world is doing it. <laughs> <laughs> so clearly we are good anyway, you know, and you're always going to struggle. Um, and I do think, um, you know, obviously, because I was coming on here, I uh, was speaking to a few people and just generally trying to understand some things. And I do think that, you know, you are a national brand. I mean, come on, you know, every, every, every single person knows NHS, right? Uh, there's not many companies that can say that. <laughs> um, but I think we've got to remember that for me, things do happen so locally uh, that actually um, trusting in those local areas to deliver what is right for their area is important. Because you could put a project in an area. I think I heard something about a project happening in Manchester, maybe. Was it Evo? Or, I can't remember. Sorry, I might have got it wrong. But a project happening here. People are probably waiting to see if it fails as opposed to thinking, hold on a minute, uh, this is what it's doing in this area. Uh, if you go into Birmingham, it's going to be a completely different thing. If you come down to Kent, it's going to be completely different. You know, so for me, it's kind of like you've got a national brand doing some fantastic things, but actually giving a bit more autonomy to the uh, kind of local areas and letting them make the decisions that's right. You're going to save a huge amount of money. It's not going to lose jobs. You're going to be more effective. Uh, and it's just a personal opinion from someone that sits outside of the organisation that you're doing some fantastic work. You can do it even better. Um, it, 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 put your hand up in the air and let a bat person come to you. Just um, you touched on it, and, and, and if you don't mind, I want to go back to it because that, that uh, mental health issues come up yeah. a lot, um, and, and more off this stage than on it. Um, I think it's fair to say. But but people like um, Norman Lamb MP have really tried to drag the issue front and centre. You've got very high-profile people. Alistair Campbell has come out and mm. talked about it. You talk very movingly uh, about it. Um, you said that you didn't think you'd made a difference to that young girl who spoke to you. I, I guarantee you did. I, you must have done. Just, maybe just not feeling alone at that time means everything. When you were at your darkest point, what dragged you out of it? Gosh. Um, I think for me personally, you know, I was a bit older, obviously. I was 33. Um, I still had my dream to go for, and that was my that was my glimmer of hope, you know, the whole dream there. But when you're in your darkest moment in a cloud, where you don't care about anything, you know, um, it's hard, you know, and it's, that's why it's so hard to, 
you know, the mental wellness area is qu quite big, uh, you know, when you're talking about the spectrum under the mental health banner. You know, and uh, originally, you know, you, you don't want to, you don't want people to know what you're going through. I didn't tell anyone when I was going through my darkest moments. You know, my coach was down at the, the apartment we were staying. My training partner was down there. I didn't tell anybody because I felt like if I tell everyone, everyone's going to either be so negative against me or be like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. It's under, it's, I don't know. I, actually three weeks later, after the darkest, darkest moments, and I can't say it was, you know, there wasn't any more, but uh, one of the darkest moments, I stood on the rostrum at the World Championships winning a silver medal and no one knew what had happened to me. And I think that almost was not a direct turning point, but a realisation that actually I know I can still be who I want to be. There's things, there are issues, but if I can get other people to deal with those things for me that rather than me worry about them um, I can maybe get out of it you know mm. and it was really with a collective team of people helping me be I just went to them look I believe I know I can do this you know I just need your help more and I told them in the fact, fact of that kind of uh, sporting em environment mm. and I think when you start to lift out of a little bit you see a tiny little glimmer you kind of you hold on to it and then you get you go and go and go again and it was just really the savior of the people but I'm just quickly, and we've run out of time, but with the mental health thing, uh, you know, I only really started to um, talk more about it. I have over the years, it's in my autobiography and everything, but I actually really only started to talk more openly about it because I decided in January this year I was going to run the London Marathon. <laughs> um, God. Bloody long way, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> For a middle distance runner that retired 11 years ago and ran around the track as far as I could a couple of times. That's a long way. <laughs> and, um, and anyway, I decided that if I'm going to do it, I've, all, I've done charity work for absolute years in my life, absolute years, and including starting my own, like I say, nine years ago. And I decided, actually, if I can bring some profile to some charities, so I picked five. One was myeloma, because of my mother. Um, uh, and then uh, my trust and a couple of others, uh, hospices. And then I thought, well, actually mine, because, you know, if I had any influence at all or that I could be open, then maybe that even that would help people. You know, because for me in the workplace, it's like a hidden disability. Someone open the door if you've got in a wheelchair or you're on crutches or whatever, OK, but if you've had the most traumatic time, whether that personally at home, and you have to come in there and still be you, and no one knows that impact, who says, are you okay? Mm -hmm. Who's going to ask you, you know, because actually it's a stigmatism. People don't want to talk. They think you're no good at your job because you might have an emotional issue. No, that's rubbish. You're not any different as a person. You're just struggling in that moment. And for me, it needs to be shouted about a bit more. But I think also one thing that I personally would love to see, and I, you know, I'm not ambassador of my mind or anyone. It's just my personal things. I'd love to see the fact that we could actually make a difference somewhere if we had some really good system to help teenagers understand what's going on in their lives and get them to be able to be taught and looked after far more because I'm so upset about the amount they're getting depression, self-harm to the point of suicide and they feel like they're not exactly listened to, helped or whatever because we can put them under the same box as everybody else, you know. And, you know, it does break my heart because I've been open more now. I've had so many people come to me. Well, I can't do anything other than keep talking about it and telling people, look, let's make some changes. And as I said, um, you may not rate that highly at the moment, but I think that is one of the things. And, you know, put it out on Twitter, ask them. Your 114,000 people will just say how very grateful they are. Um, could you please, I mean, we loved her before, but how much more do we adore this woman now? <laughs> put your hands together, please, for the wonderful, incomparable, golden Dame Kelly Holmes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.